Well, we are in session three of the book of Leviticus, and we'll address tonight chapters two and three, the meal offerings and the peace offerings. As you recall, there are six basic offerings that could be brought to the tabernacle altar. And each one teaches us something essential about Christ and His sacrifice on our behalf. It's really uh, important to keep in front of us uh, that these ancient rituals have profound significance, even to the New Testament Christian. And Paul tells us, remind, just to remind you, Paul tells us in Romans 15.4, that whatsoever things are written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through the patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. And that he goes for these, these ancient rituals that we tend often uh, to disregard as we whiz through this portion of the Scripture. We're missing some very, very fundamental insights. In the book of Leviticus, the first seven chapters have to do with these sacrificial offerings. And they can be classified in three categories. The first three are the commitment to God. And I might mention when I mention three there, by the way, I'm also counting the drink offerings, which are actually mentioned in numbers. So there's really there's there's uh, uh, five of the six are in Leviticus. There's one that, that we'll touch on as we go by. But in any case, the first three, the burnt offering and the grain or meal offerings, what causes a lot of confusion is in your King James Bible, the uh, the second group, the grain or what should be called the meal offerings or called the meat offerings. It's uh, because the King James translators, the word had a different meaning, had a broader meaning when they were translating. Today, meat means something very specific to you and I. But that's why it would be better translated the meal offerings or even better the grain offerings. And the fact that in the King James you're used to seeing the meat offerings, it's confusing us because they're the ones that are not meat. <laughs> They're grain. But in any case, we've got the burnt offering, grain or meal offering. And then also associated with these, not mentioned in Leviticus, but isn't mentioned in Numbers 15 and elsewhere, the drink offering. These are often accompanied by strong wine. And I'll come to that when we get there. But these first three are grouped together. They're the first three, but they they speak to, to our commitment to God and uh, total dedication to the Lord. They meet the specific needs of the worshiper and, and express some truth about our relationship to Christ. The second um, classification would be, the first one is commitment to God, the second classification is communion with God. And the principal one there is the fellowship offering, or called the peace offering. And then the third category is our cleansing from God, and there's two in that category, the sin offering and the guilt or trespass offering. And uh, now in this particular session we'll, we'll take chapters 2 and 3 which deal with the grain or meal offering and the fellowship or peace offering. And it's kind of interesting. If you go to the book of Daniel, in Daniel chapter 9, uh, we always talk about the... It's a very important uh, verse. The, the last verse of chapter 9 is about the Antichrist. But it says that he will cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. Now, I'm not going to get into the eschatology. In spite of the fact that we just got back from a major conference on that subject, I'm not going to deal with the eschatology per se. But there's an interesting uh, phrase there. The sacrifices... The sacrifice and oblation to cease. This linguistically highlights two great divisions. Sacrifices, which imply uh, sacrifices that are with or without blood, and uh, uh, in, in, they're with, with blood in the one sense and without blood in the other sense. You call the sacrifices and the minka, that is the, the uh, meal offering to cease. The word, therefore, oblations, translated oblations in the King James, is actually the mincha, which is a uh, uh, what I would call the meal offerings. The same term is used in the same way in 1 Samuel 3 and Psalm 40, verse 6 and elsewhere. So again, let me, uh, I, I hope that, I hope the, this meat offering term from the King James doesn't confuse you. Uh, I'm just going to call it the meal offering to, to, avoid, to keep us from getting confused. But what it represents is a person's, an offer's person and property. See, the, in the, in the burnt offering, we had the, the, the offering spoke of Jesus Christ and sacrifice. In the meal offering, it represents what we are offering, offering ourselves, both our, in our person and also our property. The first step before you can even do that is to have a burnt offering. You didn't have a meal offering without a burnt offering preceding you. And in the burnt offering, you uh, um, obtain full acceptance for your soul. And so then you come next to the, uh, the opportunity to give up your whole substance to the Lord who has redeemed you. 
So the first offering points to Jesus Christ directly. The, the, the meal offering is, our, is a form of dedication. It's generally presented um, along with some animal sacrifice to demonstrate the connection between the pardon of sin and devotion to the Lord. According to Exodus 29, incidentally, which has to do with the ordination of priests, um, it was not allowable to uh, present a burnt offering without accompanying it with a meal offering. That's a response situation. It's what you're offering to yourself. In fact, uh, 1 Corinthians 6.19 says, What know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own, for ye are bought with a price. The burnt offering that we studied last time speaks of our being purchased by a price, but the, the uh, meal offering is a, an expression of our commitment of ourselves, our persons, and all that we have uh, to the Lord. But the order is always very important. Uh, our kinsmen, in, in the book of Ruth, where we studied uh, um, Boaz, who was the kinsman redeemer, he first purchases Ruth, and then he claims the field and inheritance as the sequence, and the, the parallel is deliberate. The type that we're dealing with here was to represent a dedication of body and property that um, had no blood involved. There's no blood involved with the meal offering uh, because blood is for the life of the soul, and that's already been offered in the burnt offering. And this fundamental distinction, it startles me to realize that fundamental distinction seems to have existed as early as the days of Adam. Yes, it's codified here in the, in the, in the book of Levit- Leviticus. But uh, you may recall Cain and Abel. Uh, Cain's offering of first fruits seems very straightforward. He offered the first fruits of his, of his, uh, of his labor. And uh, it might have been accepted as a meal offering if it had not been founded, excuse me, if it had been founded on a lamb that had been slain first. Abel offered the lamb that was slain, but uh, uh, Cain offered the, fir- the, the first fruits, but it was without the blood, without the, the, uh, the, uh, the killing of the lamb. If it had been a consequence after the lamb had been, a lamb had been slain, it may have been proven acceptable. But what he was doing was offering himself, his wor- his, the, work, the works of his hands. In contrast to Abel, where in offering a lamb, he was by faith pointing to um, the uh, seed of the woman that had been promised to uh, to Eve, and uh, because Cain didn't have that, it was it was hateful to God. We're going to get we're going to talk more about this whole idea. You can't have sanctification before justification by Cain trying to give himself and his property to God as if there had been no curse. And uh, and as if there wasn't any need need for blood to wash him, is is uh, an anathema. It's it's it, it's offensive to God. He he attempted to be accepted by his own holiness, and thus sidestepping the provision God had made, which was salvation by a slain lamb, pointing of course to the ultimate lamb that was slain. So this leads to a theological issue that's very fundamental. And that is the whole idea that justification has to precede sanctification. You can't please God by anything you do if you're not first saved. You have to be justified. And you're justified by the completed work of Christ. Then uh, sanctification takes place. For example, acts of charity. If they're substituted for Christ's completed work as a means of pacifying the conscience... Uh, they make up this very sin of Cain. The same thing Cain did. The same thing that... uh, uh, And this is all in in, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4 highlights this. Cain was mistaken, but people are no less mistaken who think that by self-denial, by doing good to others uh, in their life and in their conduct, that they can obtain favor and acceptance of God. This is equivalent to offering the meal offering before being cleansed by the burnt offering. And this is, in effect, trying to sidestep or deny or demean uh, the blood of the Lamb. Strange idea to our conscience. Certainly an offensive idea to the world in general, because the world tends to to extol or venerate uh, people who uh, give themselves to, to, to the downtrodden, do things for the poor. Isn't that wonderful? From a humanistic point of view, that's wonderful. But it is ineffective at pleasing God in the absence of of them uh, being uh, 
washed in the blood of the Lamb. And uh, that's that's one of the the whole the, one of the things that can be emphasized all through the book of Leviticus is that the it's not without the shedding of blood is the basis for our being justified before God, and justification has to precede the sanctification. Now, something else about the meal offering that's not obvious from the reading, but it is when you get the whole picture, is the meal offering was offered daily along with the morning and evening sacrifice. See, in addition to the burnt offerings that we might do individually, the burnt offerings were done every morning and evening at the in the temple. And uh, they were accompanied by the meal offering. Teaching us what? That we have to commit all that we are and all that we have daily. Daily. This is not a thing. This is one of the, the problems I have with our style and our culture of the so-called altar call. Is that somehow, you know, by making a decision, coming down the aisle and making a decision for Christ, uh, once and for all, boy, that, it's done. We celebrate that as some kind of climax. And, and not that that isn't a very important milestone to, it's, but it starts a process. It starts a, a, a relationship. But there's much more to it. That's really just the beginning. And, uh, this act of commitment, uh, this act of, uh, first of all, receiving Christ and, and, uh, appropriating, uh, the, the pardon that he has paid 100% for is the first step, the essential step. The, the, but it needs to be followed by what I'll call the meal offering. And that's offering ourselves completely, without reservation, wholeheartedly, uh, all that we are and all that we have. And many people who are in a Christian walk, that, that, that step comes later as they really begin to realize the need for that, until they're, in many cases, often driven to extremists, where God does something to really get our attention and make us realize that, hey, this is not a halfway thing. If you're going to be serious about Christ, it's a, it's a, uh, we want to understand the rest of the implication of the meal offering here. The meal offering in the, in the temple cycle was uh, done daily, morning and evening, and not by some irregular impulse where they were moved by some particular circumstance, but rather... Uh, uh, Daily as a commitment, and uh, and of course the chief application of this in typological sense was Christ giving Himself completely, thoroughly, soul, body, the whole thing. Now this also may relate a little bit to uh, <laughs> what Jesus said. He says, "Take eat. This is my body, which is given for you." Matthew twenty six twenty six, and also echoed in First Corinthians eleven. We're going to see as we get into the verses here shortly that. Uh, it was made of fine wheat, pure, unspotted, and baked in suffering. And, of course, Christ is the ultimate example of the meal offering, offering all his possessions in heaven and earth, all presented to and accepted by the Father. We have a good summary of that in 1 Corinthians 15, the resurrection chapter, starting about verse 24. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 24. Then cometh the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. For he hath put all things under his feet, but when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted that did put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. And that expression in 1 Corinthians 15 is the climactic expression of everything, ultimately, in the universe, being restored back into God. The big, the big um, issue that came with Satan's rebellion is having more than one will in the universe. And this whole drama is a, is a climax when that is put back in shape. But let's get into Leviticus 2. That's so much for a preamble or warm-up. Let's get into Leviticus chapter 2, verse 1. Leviticus 2, you can label the meal offering. And bear in mind as I read the King James, when it says meat, don't be confused. Verse 1, And when any will offer a meat or meal offering unto the Lord, his offering shall be of fine flour, and he shall pour oil upon it, and put frankincense thereon. Now the fine flour, the term in the Hebrew is the soleth. It's not the coarser, more common uh, kemach, it's, 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 uh, but it's sifted well. Not less than one-tenth of an ephah, which is uh, 
An ephah is what, equivalent to roughly a bushel, I guess, so that's a, call it a quart. Um, in most cases, uh, it's much more than that. And uh, it was taken from the best of their fields. It was cleansed from the brand by being pressed through a sieve. sieve. And uh, the rich seem to have offered it on uh, a uh, in the form of fine flour, like white, almost white like snow, on a silver bowl in a very princely manner, a very formal presentation. And so this is a type or an idiom, if you will, of man's substance, and uh, or and also of himself, dedicated to God. Yet had it had been made pure by the blood of the sacrifice that had preceded this, that removed us in. Now that's, this is the, the we're going to discover there's several levels. This is the rich person's approach, the fine flour on the silver bowl and so forth. And of course, it had oil that would that, and the oil denoted being set apart, being made holy. Remember, Jacob used oil at Bethel when he uh, anointed the uh, stone pillow, commemorating his uh, vision. That's in Genesis 28. The Jacob's ladder thing and so forth. He he took oil at the next morning and and uh, set apart that uh, stone pillow that he used. Every priest and every king is set apart for service by being anointed with oil, and of course, oil also speaks to the Holy Spirit, as he sets apart, as he pleases uh, any for office. Any one of us that are uh, set apart for service are anointed by what? The Holy Spirit. So the oil is an idiom, if you will, of the Holy Spirit. It wasn't common oil, by the way. It wasn't just olive oil, although we often use that in some of our ceremonies. It was a, It actually was made up from a very specific recipe, a pure myrrh, uh, sweet cinnamon, sweet calamus, acacia, and olive oil. The formula is in Exodus 30, if you can unravel it and want to mess with that. But it's a, we most commonly use the ceremonial in just olive oil. But the... the uh, the, the oil in the Torah was a little more complicated. And also frankincense, a very familiar term to us because of the, uh, the, being one of the gifts of the Magi around Christmas time. It also was made by a special formula. It's in Exodus 30, verse 34. Um, but frankincense is regarded by the experts as to denote acceptability. Acceptability, or acceptable, acceptableness of the offering. And uh, the analogy is drawn as like a flower or a plant, the rose of Sharon or the balm of Gilead, uh, that uh, would induce some passing st- traveler to stop and enjoy the fragrance, the acceptability of it. And so, as it, tes- it's, it, it testifies of the ex- the acceptance of God of Christ's uh, character, uh, acceptance of Christ to the character of the Godhead. And we go through a lot of references on that uh, in Song of Solomon, the Book of Esther, and so forth. They'll be in the notes. We'll just keep moving on. And, of course, it was one of the prophetic gifts of the Magi. Magi what did the Magi give? Gold. What else? Frankincense. frankincense and myrrh. Good. Gold speaks of his deity, the frankincense of his priesthood, and the myrrh of his death. And it's interesting, just to, whenever you see that in Christmas and you see the three gifts... You can also, from I think it's in Isaiah 60, you can determine that in the millennium they're also going to give them gifts. They'll give them gold and frankincense, but no myrrh, because the death will be behind him. But the gold and frankincense are detailed there. So here's the flour, sifted flour. And when I always see that, I'm always reminded how uh, Jesus told Peter that Satan desire, desired Peter to do what with what to him? Sift them as wheat. That's in uh, Luke 22. Let's move to verse 2. And he shall bring, that is the offerer, shall bring it to Aaron's sons. That's the priest. Remember, not, a, a pre, the priests were Levites, yes, but not all Levites were priests. To be a priest, you had to be not only a Levite, you had to be a son of Aaron, a descendant of Aaron. So he shall bring it to Aaron's sons, the priest, and he shall take their, uh, and he shall take there out his handful of the flour thereof, and of the oil thereof, and of all the frankincense thereof, and the priest shall burn the memorial of it upon the altar to be an offering made by fire of a sweet savor unto the Lord. So we, uh, we have a, a memorial of it, a part of it. This was not all taken and put in the offer and burned, just a token of it was. Uh, a, a sort of a down payment or, or a, 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 a sample of it to represent the whole, a part for the whole. So uh, as if bringing the offeror into God's remembrance. We don't have to detail the dedication of 
all our property. A part of it is can be uh, idiomatic of the entire entirety. This term used as a memorial it occurs several places. In Acts ten four, Cornelius's uh, prayers and alms are called a memorial there. It's a specimen of of the complete dedication of the man. And he was already accepted, uh, but his meal offering was a dedication of his self and substance, and was acknowledged by God by giving Cornelius more light and and opportunity, which followed. You'll find that all in Acts chapter 10, verse 4 and following. Well, we're down to verse (laughs) 3. You make it, I think. And the remnant of the meal offering, what happens to the rest of it? See, only a small portion of it is put on the on the altar, the rest of it um, shall be Aaron's sons and his sons. Aaron's and his sons. And uh, it is a thing most holy of the offerings of the Lord made by fire. And uh, so it's declared most holy. We are assured of the thorough acceptance of dedicated things once we are forgiven. This isn't the basis of their being forgiven. They're already forgiven. If you're, if you are forgiven, then you can be assured that those things are received, uh, as dedicated things. The application here for most of us is to regard every member of our body and everything that we possess as belonging to God. Ye are not your own, the scripture tells us. Why? Because we were purchased. We were purchased by what? By, by Christ's blood. So if, if, uh, if we need to, Acknowledge and recognize and and uh, and commit, appropriate ourselves that we everything we are and everything we possess belong to God's because we're set aside not not just part of it, not just our tithe, hundred percent of it. Verse four, and if thou bring an oblation of a, of a meat offering, bacon in the oven, it shall be unleaved cakes with. Now you'll discover there's a series here of different kinds of meal offerings that go down in terms of the implied wealth of the offeror. The highest level is the, the, the rich man can have very fine, best grade flour, and that's what we talked about so far. Now we're sort of uh, talking about a second level. If thou bring an oblation of a meal offering baked, bacon in the oven, it shall be unleavened, cake, unleavened cakes, uh, a fine flour mingled with oil, or unleavened wafers anointed with oil. See, just as there are alternatives in the burnt offering that we talked about, you could have birds rather than animals, remember, and so forth. The poor had an alternative. There are also diversities of form here. For the rich, you've got the fine flour and the finest of the wheat. Otherwise, the meal offering might be baked in an oven. Uh, These are larger cakes uh, with oil mingled in them, or smaller wafers with oil uh, in them, on them. You have large cakes with oil in them, wafers with oil on them, and uh, again, the oil that sets them apart is never omitted. It's there. But it's always unleavened. We'll see that again through. There's only one place that's a very interesting study. We'll get to when we get to uh, chapter 23. There's only one case where leavened material is allowed. And that has a very, very interesting implication for all of us. We'll, it has to do with the Feast of Shavuot, and we'll talk about that when we get there. But otherwise, it's always unleavened. Why? We'll notice that leaven all through the Scripture, Old and New Testament, speaks of sin. This is another one of those examples how the Holy Spirit uh, uses an idiom consistently through the Scripture. The theologians like to give these things fancy names. It's called the principle of expositional constancy. <laughs> simply means that when the Holy Spirit uses a, an idiom, uh, idiomatic use, there's a you, it, more often than not, it's very consistently applied. The leaven is very consistently applied. It always symbolizes sin. And what's the source of sin? What's the source of all sin? Anyone? Pride. Good for you. Satan, yes, but it's his pride that it all started. And uh, leaven is an unusual. Idea, uh, example or a symbol of, of sin because it corrupts by puffing up. It corrupts by puffing up. Well, what's the application? When we do something, when we do something we're supposed to do here ceremonially, grudgingly, restless, impatient, uh, we are in effect corrupting our offering with leaven. Moving on, verse 5. And if thy oblation be a meat offering, bacon in a pan. Now, this is someone who doesn't have an oven. Ovens weren't that common. He has just a pan. Shall it be fine flour, unleavened, mingled with oil? 
See, it, 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 it baked in a fire pan or a pan. And there's going to be another one with a frying pan. It's even a lower level of utensil. You're, you're implying here people with less means as you go, each one, each one of these levels. But God excuses none, no matter what rank they are, from dedicating themselves and their substance to Him. Whatever level they find themselves, there was a mechanic, there was a means by which they could create a meal offering to, to uh, uh, represent their commitment their, of, of uh, all that they are they have to Him. And, of course, the extreme example. We're all familiar with the, the most extreme example of all of this. Remember the widow with the two mites? You find that in uh, Mark 12. It wasn't just that the two mites were like, what, pennies huh? or less, a fraction of a penny, actually. Um, that wasn't the only point. It was all that she had. She had two mites. She didn't give one of them. She gave them both. And that was all she had, Jesus says. Profound commitment. Verse 6, Thou shalt part it in pieces, part it in pieces, and pour oil thereon. It is a meat offering. The division of pieces suggests that every part of their substance is to be given up, and we must allow God to uh, divide appropriate as as He pleases, yet every part must be anointed with oil. Verse 7, And if thy oblation be a meat offering, bacon in the frying pan. It shall be made of fine flour with oil and the frying pan. That in Arabic it's tagan. It indicates poverty. You know these utensil names don't mean much to us because we have a different kind of economy. In their world, we went, we went from the just the fine flour, specially prepared, or the oven. As you go down that list, it implies lower economic levels involved. We get to verse eight, and thou shalt bring the meat offering that is made of these things unto the Lord and. When it is presented unto the priest, he shall bring it unto the altar. And that's not uh, uh, redundant. What, what it's implying here is the, meat, the, the priest will not despise the lesser offerings. Whatever it is they bring, he will bring it to the altar. All are welcome at any, 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 any level. Verse 9, The priest shall take from the meat offering a memorial thereof and shall burn it upon the altar. It is an offering made by fire of a sweet savor unto the Lord. And so the memorial here is done much as the same it had been done with the fine flour. And there's no virtue in size or quality of the, of the thing. It's interesting, Paul uses the same phrase, sweet smell, sweet, uh, sweet smell of the offering, when he speaks of the poor Philippians. Remember the Philippians, the church at Philippi was very, very poor. And yet they're the ones that were so generous in supporting Paul and always making sure he had his needs. And he makes, makes a big point of that in Philippians chapter 4. And he refers to it as the sweet smell of the poor Philippians' generous gifts and so on. Okay, verse 10. And that which is left of the meat offering shall be Aaron's and his sons. It is a thing most holy of the offerings of the Lord made by fire. This echoes back to verse 3, really. But um, See, we can't say, I give myself to the Lord and then do as we please. See, the Lord takes us at our word. We are no more our own. He purchased us with His blood. Verse 11. No meat offering which ye shall bring unto the, unto the Lord shall be made with leaven, for ye shall burn no leaven, nor any honey in any offering of the Lord made by fire. Leaven, as I we said it before, indicates a corruption by sin. It is the opposite of salt. We'll talk about that in a minute. Honey was forbidden. I, that surprised me. I mean, we're speaking not, not in general. You could have eat honey. It was forbidden as an offering. And uh, there are all kinds of scholastic uh, speculations as to why. Partly is because it turns to sourness, and it also leads to fermentation, which is what the um, what the leaven does. It it it, it uh, sweet at first, but it it it, uh, it uh, is used idiomatically, at least uh, uh, in terms that's forbidden. Verse twelve. And as for the oblation of the first fruits, ye shall offer them unto the Lord, but they shall not be burnt on the altar for a sweet savor. They're not burnt. Christ is our first fruits. He is now glorified, but his suffering is done. Verse 13. <clears throat> and every oblation of thy meat offering thou shalt season with salt. Neither shalt thou suffer the salt of the covenant of thy God to be lacking from any of thy meat offering. With all thine offerings thou shalt offer salt. Well, <laughs> Salt is the opposite of the leaven. Salt purifies, 
and it keeps wholesome. It's a preservative. And it indicates also that the corruption has been removed and prevented in terms of the use here. Salt, by the way, is also, throughout the Scripture and through the ancient world, was an emblem of abiding friendship. Abiding friendship. You'll see all through the Scripture even, you'll see this expression, the covenant of salt. Numbers 18, verse 9, 2 Chronicles 13, 5, and elsewhere. Nearly every major contract uh, was uh, uh, um, ratified and approved by eating together by the two parties, and salt was present. Salt was the, considered the, the seal because it was a symbol of friendship, and, 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 uh, and so it's used as an emblem that way. So they'll, they'll speak of a covenant of salt, which implies that they, they not only agreed, they sat down and feasted and, and, and uh, committed themselves to whatever it was. Interesting expression, and that gives us, as, as you begin to understand that cultural coloring, if you will, of the vocabulary, <laughs> you get a different insight when you hear about Lot's wife turning and turning into a pillar of salt. She was turning away. She was instructed not to, and she did. You know, she broke the, she broke the rule. So I don't know if that's a link or not. I just, it just popped in my mind. I had to sort of throw it out. But anyway, verse 14. And if thou offer a meat offering, of thy first fruits under the, uh, on the salt. Just let me, uh, one other thought. All the offerings involve salt. All the offerings involve, involve salt. Uh, that the, you'll pick up on that as we get into some of the others. It's taken, in other words, it's taken for granted reading. Really. Anyway, verse 14. If thou offer a meat offering of thy first fruits under the Lord, thou shalt offer for thy meat offering of thy first fruits green ears of corn dried by the fire, even corn beaten out of full ears. The ears of corn. We don't think of corn, <laughs> ears of corn, as a type of Christ. But do you remember what he said in John 12, verse 24? Of a kernel of corn, it isn't until it dies that it brings forth much fruit. And by the way, the, the term here, the Hebrew, uh, caramel is the term used, it intimates uh, ears of the most, uh, the best kind, the best kinds of corns here. And of course, it's, uh, it also implies, you see, it's dried by fire. And you can compare that to Psalm 22, verse 14, Psalm 102, 4, and so forth, where he was in, in extremis himself. Well, moving on, verse 15, Thou shalt put oil upon it and lay frankincense thereon, for it is the meat offering. And the priest shall burn the memorial of it. In other words, just part of it, the rest of the priest keeps for his own use. The priest shall burn the memorial of it, part of the beaten corn thereof and part of the oil thereof and all the frankincense thereof, it is an offering made by fire unto the Lord. Interesting, they took just part of it. I didn't make that point earlier. They take part of it just to be a token and the rest belonged to the priest for his use. But they burned all the frankincense. The frankincense speaks of acceptance. The point is even though they're burning only a small part of it, the whole thing's accepted is the, is the, is the, the translation into uh, the typology here. And, of course, the smoke and the fragrance ascend to heaven. All is accepted. Christ first, and then each of his people. Now, not mentioned in Leviticus, but I mention it here because it completes the, 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 the list of, of, of sacrifices and it fits here, is the drink offering. Leviticus doesn't make mention of it here, but Numbers 15 does. It was never offered by itself alone. It just simply accompanied whatever else they were, any, the, the offerings that were giving. It was strong, according to Numbers 28, verse 7, it was strong wine poured unto the Lord. I don't know how the Baptist will turn that into grape juice. I'll leave that alone. But uh, it was strong wine poured unto the Lord. It was not observed until they came to Canaan. Leviticus, of course, is focusing on the wilderness wanderings. There's going to be 40 years of wandering around. But when they get to Canaan in the land, that's when the drink offering is uh, uh, observed. But it's also going to be observed in the millennium. We find reference of it in uh, Ezekiel 47, verse 17. So you'll hear of the drink offering, the libation. Uh, it's, it's almost sort of incidental, but it is one of the specific offerings. So... We are in chapter, we can get another chapter under our belt. Let's jump right into Leviticus chapter 3, but we're going to take on a different subject here. These are the peace offerings. And how do you say peace in Hebrew? Shalom. Exactly. And so uh, 
They're going to be, now this, we're getting back now to a blood offering. We've talked about the meal offerings. King James says meat, but I, 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 we'll use those terms interchangeably. We really should be saying meal offering. We're now going to talk about what's called a peace offering, but it's going to be a bloody offering. And it's going to have some striking similarities to this, the burnt offering we took up in chapter one. It also has some distinctive differences. So you want to be sensitive to that as we go here. All bloody sacrifices represent Christ in his character of being an expiation for sin. Because he's the one, it was his shed blood that avails for us. So each one of the blood sacrifices uh, have Christ at the center of it in some slightly different uh, uh, emphasis. The differences here is that um, this class of offering, there's going to be three different kinds, peace offerings, focuses on the results um, and the reception of Christ's sacrifice rather than the manner of it. And uh, subtle differences we'll get into. And of course, the Hebrew word uh, for peace is shalom. But what it means is more than what is commonly recognized. Uh, it means more than peace. As in the sense, we use the term peace as almost as, as a cessation of hostilities. You know, the, 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 the Hebrew term peace or shalom means much more than that. It means prosperity, welfare, joy, happiness. So when someone says shalom, he's wishing you more than just that you'd be uh, not hostile. <laughs> you see? It's, it's uh, prosperity, welfare. He's, 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 he's commenting on your welfare. Now, the old Greek translation, the Septuagint translation of this, renders the, the, the term in Greek terms that signify a sacrificial feast of salvation. It's a term that uh, is used also of victims that are slain for a banquet, like the slaughtering the fatting, fatted calf of the prodigal son, that kind of a thing. That's the term that's uh, suggested. It's intended to suggest gladness, not the doom. You and I have a tough time getting over the fact that, gee, they slaughtered an animal. Yes, but the thing is, is a celebration, very analogous to the, the prodigal son fatted calf thing. We have, we don't have trouble with that one. The son's come home, he's being restored, they're celebrating his being restored, they slaughter the fatted calf. It's that flavor that we're dealing with here. Romans 5.1 is wrapped up in this. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's a celebration. Therefore, being just, your justification is behind us. We've been justified by faith. We've committed ourselves to it, and we have peace with God. It's a peace offering. It will point to the peace that all believers have in communion, in koinonia, uh, with the, uh, the Father by the Holy Spirit. So this is a peace offering. It's a communion offering. It's a fellowship offering. You and I could call it koinonia. And, of course, that's what we all do call it when we celebrate communion. There is an analogy of sorts here with communion that we take in the the New Testament sense. This is also, I think, an expression of what Paul summarizes in Ephesians chapter 2. You might run with me from Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13 and following, where Paul says, But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were afar off, are made near or nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances. For to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were afar off, and to them that were nigh. For through him we both have access by one Spirit unto the Father. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth into a holy temple of the Lord in whom ye are also built together for an inhabitation of God through the Spirit. And on he goes. Ephesians chapter 2. Any remarkable favor was a call for a peace offering. Any great deliverance, anything that happened in your life that was you know, a big plus of some kind. Uh, any noble achievement that you, that might have happened was an appropriate occasion for what for this celebration called a peace offering. 
And but it was all it but it always followed a burnt offering and its attendant meal offering. That's a very, very important principle. Yes, you could celebrate it, but it presumed that you had the burnt offering preceded it, which spoken spoke of your justification, where Jesus Christ paid for your sin, and a meal offering in which you commit your substance in response to that uh, uh, act of, of Christ. Okay. Well, let's see what's going on. Let's jump into verse 1, see how far we get here. And if his oblation be sacrifice of peace offering, it sh- if, it, if he shall offer it of the herd, we're going to have a herd, a flock, and a goat before we're through, okay? If it's, if it offered of the herd, that implies that it's a bullock or cattle, right? Uh, a herd, whether it be male or female, he shall offer it without blemish before the Lord. Has to be without blemish indeed. But you notice something different from the burnt offering here. It could be a female. Didn't have to be a male. Because that, that's not what it's, what the focus of it is here. And here's the difference. Uh, it, uh, the female, uh, uh, female offering was printed because it is the capacity, it is, uh, uh, the capacity of the offerer to enjoy Christ that is in view. The offerer will never find as much in Christ as God did. The first one was what God saw in Christ. The burnt offering was what God saw in Christ. That'd be a male, Bob Blemish, totally consumed and so forth. This one's going to be a little different, as you'll see. There's some other differences coming. But because the focus is on the capacity of the offerer, not of Christ himself, uh, it can be a male or female. And he shall lay his hand upon the head of the offering, that's to get the identity, the transfer, if you will, and kill it at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and Aaron's sons, the priests, shall sprinkle the blood upon the altar round about. So, so far, it sounds very duplicative of the burnt offering in terms of procedure. Verse 3, And he shall offer the sacrifice of the peace offering, an offering made by fire unto the Lord, the fat that covereth the innards, and all the fat that is upon the innards. He's not burning the whole thing, he's burning part of it. But it's the most inward parts, the most tender parts, that belong to the Lord. That's the one that we're, that, that's what they're burning. And the two kidneys, and the fat that is on them, which is by the flanks, and the call above the liver, and the kidneys, it shall he take away. See, in the burnt offering, everything was put on there. The whole thing was placed on the altar. The whole thing was was uh, burned. Here, in the peace offering, only a portion is. It's the most it's the most choice portion, uh, but the fat and the inward. It was considered the hidden riches of the whole thing. And this is a, 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 you, you reminded uh, somewhat of Philippians three, where Paul cries out that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. It's a, it's, it's a response situation. Verse 5, And Aaron's son shall burn it on the altar upon the burnt sacrifice, which is upon the wood that is on the fire. It is an offering made by fire of a sweet savor unto the Lord. Verse 6, And his offering for a sacrifice, a peace offering of the Lord, shall be of the flock, male or female, he shall offer with abundance. Now we're going to talk about an alternative form of this. We've talked about the bullock, cattle, herd. Now we're going to talk of the flock. That implies a lamb. If his offering be a sacrifice of peace, offering to the Lord be of the flock, male or female, he shall offer it without blemish. If he offer a lamb for his offering, then he shall offer it before the Lord. See, the bullock or the heifer spoke of the uh, typified the servant side of the of, of the Lord's ministry. Jesus Christ is presented as the uh, as the servant in the primarily in the Gospel of Mark. We have Matthew; he's presented as the Mashiach, Nagid, the Messiah. Mark, the, su- the ox, the suffering servant. Luke the man, John the the son of God. Each gospel has this particular emphasis, but Mark especially focuses on Jesus Christ as the obedient servant. And that's what's sort of in view typologically with the first one we talked about, the bullock. The second one here, the lamb, is uh, identifies Jesus Christ in terms uh, uh, with... Uh, uh, he identifies Christ with the man in his life and his death. It's substitutionary lamb. Remember, Abel made his sacrifice with a lamb. And Isaiah 53 makes it very clear that Jesus Christ was our substitute. He was in our place. It's that substitutionary aspect that's in focus. In fact, let's remind ourselves of that. Let's turn to Isaiah 53 and just take a couple of verses. I would take the whole chapter if we had the time, but I think we'd better keep moving. Um, starting about verse 4, Surely He hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. 
The chastisement of our peace is upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. And all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, but the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. And he goes on. That substitution, very emphatic. We also see that in his resurrection in, in, in uh, Revelation chapter 5. We, we see the, the, uh, uh, the lamb, uh, when he receives the seventh seal book, we see the lamb as it had been slain. We also see him in his wrath in Revelation 6. The kings of the earth hide in caves saying, save, you know, save us from the wrath of the lamb. And uh, so the, the lamb is that substitution aspect. Anyway, verse 8, He shall lay his hand upon the head of the offering, kill it before the tabernacle of the congregation, and the Aaron's son shall sprinkle the blood there of round about upon the altar. And they shall offer the sacrifice of the peace offering, an offering made by fire unto the Lord, the fat thereof, and the whole rump. And he shall take off hard by the backbone, and the fat that covereth the innards, and the fat that is upon the, on the innards. Now, um, there's a phrase here called the whole rump. Gets a lot of commentary. Turns out in Syrian sheep, the part that was considered the most valuable was part of the tail. And on that particular breed, the tail could weigh, it was very fatty and it weighed about 15 pounds. And it was considered among the shepherds the most desirable part. And so that, that echoes here in the text, uh, very uh, part of it. Anyway, verse 10. And the two kidneys and the fat that is upon them and the, and which is by the flanks and the call above the liver and the kidneys, it shall he take away. The ritual here is very similar. That's God's per- portion. It was considered the best part, the innermost part of the animal. That was the Lord's. The priest shall burn up on the altar, and it was, and it is the food of the offering made by fire unto the Lord. Notice there isn't the sweet savor here. It's the it's a food of the offering, food by fire, and the f- expression is uh, characteristic of a situation where a friend is entertaining guests. That's the imagery that we put here. A uh, good example, let me echo this from Deuteronomy 12. In Deuteronomy 12, verses 6 and 7, it says, And thither shall ye bring your burnt offerings and your sacrifice and your tithes and heave offerings of your hand and your vows and your free will offerings and the firstlings of your herds and your flocks. And there shall ye eat before the Lord your God, and ye shall rejoice in all that ye put your hand into, ye and your households wherein the Lord thy God hath blessed thee. The point is the language there is of a banquet. Now, Part of this, the peace offering, part of it's given to the Lord. It's burnt there. The rest, the, the priest receives the breast and the shoulder. And the offerer, the, what was left, the offeror uh, ate. It was his. And God was the host. The sinner was the guest is the imagery here. And once you grab that, then suddenly all kinds of other verses in the Scripture start to make more sense. If you visualize this as a banquet, where you're partici- where the sinner is being uh, hosted by God. That's when Psalm 23, verse 5 makes sense. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Psalm 36, 8. Thou, they shall abundantly be satisfied with the fatness of thy house, and thou shalt make them drink of the river of thy pleasures. Again, the idiom is being banqueted with the Lord. Jesus makes a very, very uh, strange uh, uh, expression that we encounter in John 6. Jesus says, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. The bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. That's pretty strange language. He's speaking idiomatically, of course. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. And he that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the living Father has sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. And of course that confused them, <laughs> as you can imagine. And then of course it climaxes too in the, la- in, the, in, the, in the Last Supper, Matthew 26, verse 26. As they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, and so on. And again, the, the, the modeling that I think best characterizes the flavor of this is the prodigal son. When he repents, comes home, he's restored, they celebrate his restoration by doing what? Killing the fatted calf. There's, the, there's that idiom of, of merit, if you will, the fatted calf, when the son was restored to fellowship. And from here we go to 1 John chapter 1 and just read that whole chapter, but we're going to move on to verse 12. 
And if his offering be a goat, here's the third type. We've talked about the bullock, we've talked about the lamb, now we're going to talk about a third level, the goat. Each one of these typifies a slightly different um, emphasis on, on Christ, what Christ did for us. He was obedient as a servant. He was uh, our substitute. And now we have uh, a, um, a uh, final identification. When you think of a goat, you think of the, the uh, scapegoat that uh, we'll be talking about uh, when we get to Yom Kippur. Here is the final type, the identification as Christ is being adequate to take away the sin of man. And this is uh, commented on in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 4, uh, excuse me, 6 through 14. And shall take, anyway, he shall t- lay his hand upon the head of it, kill it before the tabernacle of the congregation, and the sons of Aaron shall sprinkle the blood thereof upon the altar round about. And he shall offer thereof his offering, even the offering made by fire unto the Lord, the fat that is, that uh, covereth the innards, and all the fat that is upon the innards, and the two kidneys, and the fat that is upon them, which is by the flanks, and the call above the liver, and the kidneys, it shall he take away. Again, it's the emphasis of the fatty part. This is considered the desirable part. This, that portion was the Lord's. In verse 16, the priest shall burn them upon the altar. It is a food of the offering made by fire for a sweet savor. All the fat is the Lord's. It shall be a perpetual statute for your generations throughout all your dwellings that ye eat neither the fat nor the blood. See, the fat, because it's the Lord's, he demands the best, and you go all through the Scripture on that one. The prohibition of eating blood, and we're going to take up in depth when we get to chapter 17 of Leviticus. Now, these these uh, ordinances, these rituals, obviously um, can uh, be abused. Uh, they, they can often turn to sin. One of the most uh, conspicuous examples is uh, the lascivious woman in uh, Proverbs chapter 7. She's, she's, she, she's just completed her offerings at the temple, and then she goes about to play the role of a prostitute in quite articulate language there in, in Proverbs 7. But it's interesting that, that you, you, you watch your conduct and you wonder what on earth were those offerings about. They were obviously empty and devoid of any commitment on her part. They were just rituals she's going through. And you can contrast that with the worshiper in Psalm 66, and uh, which starts about verse 13. Who's a different? I will go into thy, thy house with burnt offerings. I will pay thee my vows, that's peace offerings, which my lips have uttered and my mouth has spoken which, when I was in trouble. I will offer unto thee burnt sacrifices of fatlings with the incense of rams. I will offer bullocks with goats. Come and hear all ye that fear God, and I will declare what he hath done for my soul. I cried unto him with my mouth, and he was extolled with my tongue. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. So, but verily God hath heard me. He hath attended to the voice of my prayer. Blessed be God, which hath not turned away my prayer, nor his mercy from me. So that's a quick summary of chapters 2 and 3. The meal offering, which is an offering of our commitment to him. And the peace offering, which is the celebration that uh, Christ has brought us peace with God. Uh, Let's stand for a closing word of prayer. Your assignment for next time is to read chapters 4 through 7 and uh, study 4 and 5 particularly. Okay, Let's bow our hearts. Well, Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you have illuminated this incredible, incredible event called the cross. It has more ramifications than we can absorb. We thank you, Father, that the perfect sacrifice on that cross paid for our sin, that perfect sacrifice merits our unqualified commitment of all that we are, all that we possess. We thank you, Father, that it also is our peace with you. We thank you, Father, that you've gone to these extremes. We do pray, Father, through your Holy Spirit that you would illuminate this word, and even more, Father, that through your Holy Spirit, you would elicit in us the response that would please you. We pray, Father, that we each might 
more fully appreciate what you've done for us and be more responsive to your will in our lives, Father, as we as we just commit ourselves, we bring bef- bring before your throne our meal offering of ourselves, total, without reservation, just seeking fellowship with you, Father, so that peace which passes all understanding would indeed keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, in whose name we do pray. Amen.